namaste and welcome to all the participants this is our uh, epi episode 6 in a, in a series of webinars that triple a insolvency and uh, its team is doing today at 4 pm on this sunday we have come with a subject which is a burning issue it relates to the fee of the rp where some controversial judicial pronouncements has been made and we have today with us advocate aditya gauri he will also share his experience about various judgments on rp fee as an rp uh, we have started feeling that some adverse judgments are coming and the rp is otherwise also under stress because of uh, uh, more competition uh, less business in the market and also reducing fees however whenever there is a, a dispute about rp fee the different kind of judgments are coming which shows that the rp has not been able to establish the kind of hard work uh, rp is doing so we have various issues today which we would attend to for example we would first uh, brief about the various provisions regarding rp fee or the liquidators fee in the code also uh, in the regulations then uh, we would analyze the uh, various judicial pronouncements which empowers the committee of creditors to modify the fee of the uh, rp uh, from the back date retrospectively also we would discuss about the powers of the ibbi to fix or decide the fee of the rp or irp powers of the adjudicating authority for <clears throat> fixing the fee and also like what kind of stay uh, where the fee is payable or where the fee is not payable uh, that's a very very like kind of uh, a critical issue as of now Uh, the supreme court has also said in one order that nclt should not uh, pass ad hoc orders regarding the fee of the rp that order was in january 22 it was passed that also we would discuss so this is the subject today and i believe uh, uh, the uh, most of us would be interested in this subject aditya what is your opinion how uh, critical how burning this issue is as far as the fee of the rp is concerned good evening everyone so uh, i mean being an advocate who is uh, representing a lot of insolvency professionals and liquidators in the market today the burning question is there because uh, the fees is a question whereby the nclt do has the jurisdiction and do has been mandated by the supreme court to you know scrutinize and uh, you know adjudicate properly as to the quantum of the fees but they are not very willing today and when it when when the fees is in question they would just want to pass a few orders and just you know move ahead and not get into the controversy controversy either with the coc or the market per se so i think uh, such questions are to be considered properly and uh, they should be scrutinized so i think uh, that we should start our uh, uh, right sir we should start our presentation and in between uh, the format is like uh, whatever questions i would request all the participants to uh, put their questions on the q and a uh, tab and yeah. aditya you would find a relevant questions and you can even in between also after every 15 minutes we would take the questions even if right. something comes in your mind at a particular time you can also add wherever you find that it is supposed to be added so primarily it is regarding the uh, rp fees or irp fees and expenditure uh, will cover some part of the liquidators fees but then so far there has not been many uh, issues regarding the liquidator fees so that actually becomes a separate subject altogether just let me share my screen so participants today it's again uh, like landmark judgments and provisions with regard to the remuneration of insolvency professionals and 
obligation of the creditors to contribute this is also uh, um, i will actually come back to you because why we we are uh, trying to say that uh, because see we uh, let's try to find out first the provisions as per the ibc along with the regulations and circulars uh, so the first thing which are, comes to our mind is the section 5 subsection 13 of ibc which talks about the definition of insolvency resolution process cost which includes the uh, uh, any interim finance or any cost incurred for raising such finance fees payable to any person acting as a rp the cost incurred by the rp in running the business of the corporate debtor as a going concern so uh, by, i would only stay for a moment because see, any expenditure that we incur for running the uh, company as a going concern and that is considered to be a insolvency resolution process cost so that means if there is a loss if there is a loss uh, in running the organization that loss will also be considered as cirp cost so in most of the cases we have seen that if there is a loss that actually comes to the depletion of current assets and one finally the in liquidation process when the uh, company goes into liquidation so the fresh inventories are made so the liquidator would normally say that the recovery from the current assets is reduced whereas it is not a correct thing in case the company has incurred loss of say 10 crores during cirp period that 10 crore would be the insolvency resolution process cost and that would be separately contributed by all the stakeholders however the current assets would be considered as this amount also would be considered as uh, the Uh, proceeds or realization from the current assets and should also be distributed accordingly so this is where i just wanted to stay on this uh, the next is any cost incurred at the expense of the government to facilitate the insolvency resolution process now this is again a little controversial the cost incurred at the expense of the government to facilitate the insolvency resolution process one we are saying that the a resolution applicant will have to provide for the payment of insolvency resolution process cost now in case we read this any cost incurred at the expense of the government to facilitate the insolvency resolution process now what can be the cost which is incurred by the government or incurred at the expense of the government to facilitate the irp amen this is something which is not seen so far uh, like what kind of cost would become cirp cost and how it would be contributed by uh, under section 53 or by the uh, successful resolution applicant any other cost as may be specified by the board so we have the regulation so we will see read the regulation because it is to be specified by the board then when we see the section 30 of ibc it is mentioned very clearly that the rp shall examine each resolution plan received by him to confirm that each resolution plan provides for payment of insolvency resolution process cost in a manner specified by the board in priority to the payment of other debt so that is the regulation the regulation says that the uh, cirp cost would be paid on priority uh, as against any other debtors then coming to the regulations and this is the uh, cirp regulations and regulation 31 again defines the insolvency resolution process cost and it is says that the amount due to suppliers of essential goods and services under regulation 32 that also because this is basically in case we go back and see that part because this is the any a cost incurred for running the company so this this is basically for running the company so a fee payable to authorized representative uh, the, this is only the uh, the when this ar concept came for class of creditors so this was added uh, out of pocket expenses of the authorized representative this is also for class of creditors as per section 25 capital a amount due to a person whose rights are prejudicially affected on account of the moratorium imposed under section 14 1d no aditya as a lawyer what do you understand about this clause any amount due to a person whose rights are prejudicially affected on account of the moratorium imposed under section 14 1d i can only assume since the uh, landlords cannot get their property vacated so therefore they are given priority 
because see in case uh, they are not getting rent and they have no right to get the property vacated right. so therefore they are actually uh, having a right to claim it as the cirp cost because their rights were prejudicially affected because of the setting of the moratorium because they were not able to recover the money they were not able to get their property vacated so they were <clears throat> the people who were prejudicially affected so that right. money has to be paid so actually uh, uh, this is and the... what is what else is coming in your mind uh, which covers into this particular uh, clause b i think sir that the prejudicially affected people would be the landlords per se and uh, the people who would have like direct interest and uh, some litigation would be pending i guess and due to the moratorium those things cannot be taken any forward i think uh, this particular cost would cover that but see like so far we haven't seen any judicial pronouncement on specific Correct. specific on this, this clause on yes. this clause and i think this is something that can be used as a clause for recovery of rent and also for the priority of the rent payment because see the landlords are prejudicially impacted uh, because see they are not getting the rent they are not even getting their property vacated so the next is i expenses incurred on or by the interim irp to the extent ratified under section th regulation 33 now this is also a very specifically written to the extent ratified under regulation 33 for irp's expenditure it has to be ratified by coc expenditures incurred on or by the rp fixed under regulation 34 so the regulation 33 deals with irp regulation 34 deals with I uh, rp other cost directly related to the corporate insolvency resolution process and approved by the committee that is all the cirp cost definition is essential supplies the regulation 32 the essential goods and services referred to in this electricity water telecommunication services information technology services to the extent these are not a direct input to the output produced or supplied by the corporate debtor like in case of illustration like in case the water is supplied to the corporate debtor the essential service i think this is another uh, uh, this is another uh, item which can be covered aditya in uh, this uh, uh, clause b uh, prejudicially clause b. affected so, because see the these people like these suppliers of electricity water telecommunication they are uh, uh, they see that they are prejudicially impacted uh, because they have to continue their supplies and whatever their charges would be they would be claiming it as cirp cost so this has to be seen in mind like any electricity bill which is uh, which is the uh, electricity bill which is not required for production that is a cirp cost similarly water telecommunication ser service information technology however there is a rider there is a rider that the uh, it should not be for the production purposes it should not be for the business of the company in case it is for the business of the company then it has to be paid regularly however aditya if you recall there is an order which says that these services would not be discontinued uh, provided the current dues are being paid after now, this i am uh, but now i understand that the current dues are basically forming part of cirp having the highest priority so that order can also be that judicial pronouncement can also be reviewed in view of this clause which is there in uh, which is there in uh, regulation 31 so i think all these essential services essential goods and services that means that the amount uh, these these parties are prejudicially impacted they would not be able to discontinue the service however they would be able to supply the they, they would be able to get their payment under cirp cost i, I think uh, irrespective of whether the current bills are being paid or not Uh, they would actually be considered as cirp cost cirp cost uh, regulation 33 talks about the irp fees the uh, irp fees is fixed by applicant because there is a lot of controversy in the profession uh, the applicant for example an operational creditor or 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 any financial creditor fix the fee with the uh, fit with the irp because see whenever the irp is appointed by the Uh, adjudicating authority on the recommendation of the applicant uh, that means that the applicant and the irp must have settled their fees and whatever the fees is settled that is the uh, that is the uh, uh, that is the, the that irp should get it 
So at the adjudicating authority shall fix expenses where the applicant has not fixed the expenses under the regulation. So whatever orders that we are getting uh, while the CIRP commencement orders are issued and we see the expenses like 2 lakhs, 5 lakhs, 3 lakhs figures are there, that is because of this regulation, the adjudicating authority shall fix the expenditure and the application the applicant shall bear the expenditure which shall be reimbursed by the committee to the extent it ratifies so now when, when we read this clause it is very clear that whatever contribution is coming from applicant maybe two lakh three lakh that is only an advance to irp and finally it will be recovered from the committee of creditors uh, it will be reimbursed by the committee to the extent it ratifies so this is the first thing in case you see this regulation 33 it, this is the first thing where it is written that the expenditures are supposed to be reimbursed by the committee. Otherwise, we haven't found any provision in the law which says that the expenditures would have to be reimbursed by the COC or the fee of the RP or the IRP has to be paid by the COC. However, this regulation 33 says that it has to be reimbursed by the committee to the extent it ratified. So whatever they ratify, they have to pay for it. This is the only provision that I found in the entire code, uh, including regulations. Next is the, the amount of expenses ratified by the committee shall be treated as IRP cost. And for the purpose of this regulation, expenses include the fees to be paid to the IRP, fees to be paid to the IPE, and if any, and all other professionals, etc. So uh, this was the uh, regulation which we used when we said that the, the fee for the IRP RP and the IPE has to be separately built. Now the regulation 34 talks about the cost of resolution professional because now the IRP has been converted into RP. So these are the costs that the committee shall fix the expenditure. So in the case of IRP, the expenditure, the fee was fixed by the applicant. In the case of RP, the fee is fixed by the committee, COC by on by by uh, by the resolution professional and the expenditure uh, that will constitute as the cirp cost again the same thing rp irp ipe fees has to be separately then uh, the regulation 34 capital a was added when it was uh, required to disclose the cost the irp or the rp as the case may be shall disclose item wise CIRP cost in such manner as will be required by the board. So board has actually provided a uploading of this cost uh, by all the IRP or the RP and that's regularly being done. So we've seen the CIRP uh, regulations and also the provisions in the code. Now let us see what is in the insolvency professionals regulations. IBBI has issued the regulations for insolvency professionals and in case we see regulation or the clause 25, it says that the, uh, the insolvency professional must provide services for remuneration, which uh, is charged in a transparent manner, uh, is a reasonable reflection of the work done and necessarily and the properly undertaken and is not inconsistent with the applicable regulations. The clause 25 capital A, capital A says that an insolvency professional shall disclose the fee payable to him, the fee payable to the IPE and the fee payable to professionals engaged by him in the insolvency professional agency of which he is a professional member. So we all are supposed to disclose the fee payable to uh, everyone. We have to disclose it to IPA. Then insolvency professional shall not accept any fee or charges other than those which are disclosed to or and approved by the person fixing his remuneration. Uh, that means all the fee, everything has to be disclosed to the COC. Uh, then the insolvency professional shall disclose all costs towards the insolvency resolution process, cost, liquidation cost, or cost of the bankruptcy as applicable to all relevant stakeholders and must endeavor to ensure that such costs are not unreasonable so whenever our committee, whenever anyone else asks for the cost of the uh, process, I think the insolvency professional is under obligation to disclose what is the cost of the uh, what is the cost of the process. So now we are saying that uh, there is no express provision in the code 
that the committee of creditor is required to contribute towards the cost of CIRP. So, Aditya, uh, like since we, uh, since this uh, beginning of this code, uh, we have always uh, seen that the contribution has to come from the COC members. COC members. However, however, the Aditya, we couldn't find any provision where it is mentioned that the COC uh, should contribute. Except right. that, is, except that in one line that says that the which whatever has been contributed by applicant that will be reimbursed to the applicant by the committee. That's the only line that we found in uh, regulation 33 of CIRP regulations. Otherwise, nowhere we found that the committee has to contribute for the CIRP cost. I think this so, is an idea which yeah. was developed by uh, judicial pronouncements per se because no express provisions were there and IBBI as on today has not brought any executive decisions whereby the COC may be you know, mandated directly. So this was into the hands of the adjudicating authority to use its judicial pronouncements mechanism and tell the people who are running the CIRP to contribute to the expenses being paid. I think it would have been better in case the, the law also would have provided for this. So we would have avoided all these litigations, but the law has not provided for it. Uh, the law has only provided that this cost will be borne by the corporate debtor or from the assets of the corporate debtor or from the resolution plan or uh, from the liquidation cost and uh, from the liquidation proceeds. Couple of other uh, provisions that we can see uh, as far as uh, IBC is concerned in uh, section 52 subsection 8, it is very clearly said that the amount of insolvency, but that's only uh, uh, when this uh, uh, the secured creditor uh, will not will opt to proceed the uh, to recover the security interest uh, and is not relinquishing uh, uh, its security interest in favor of the liquidation estate, then this subsection says that the amount of insolvency resolution process cost due from secured creditors who realize their security interest in the manner provided in the in this section shall be deducted from the proceeds of any realization by such secured creditor and they shall transfer such amount to the liquidator uh, to be included in the liquidation estate so this is very clear uh, that in case the cirp fails the liquidation starts and the secured creditors, in case the secured creditors is not willing to relinquish security interest in favor of the liquidation estate, then he will have to pay the insolvency resolution process cost, which is due from the secured creditors who realize their security interest in the manner provided in this section. Uh, we also have an added regulation, which I will uh, uh, read on the next slide. And then section 53 says that the distribution of assets, that's very clear that the insolvency resolution process cost and the liquidation cost paid in full, that is something which is on a priority. The insolvency resolution process and liquidation cost has to be paid in full. That's provided in section 53 before any other payment is made. In the liquidation process regulations, there are two things regarding the contribution of liquidation cost, which Regulation 2, capital A, says the contribution to liquidation cost, where the committee of creditors did not approve a plan under sub Regulation 3 of Regulation 39B of the CIRP regulations, the liquidator shall call upon the financial creditors being financial institutions. Because the Regulation 2, capital A of liquidation process regulation is only applicable to those stakeholders who are financial institutions as they are supposed to contribute the excess of the liquidation cost over the liquid assets. So in case the liquidation cost estimated is one crore and the liquid assets of the company is only 40 lakhs, so the balance 60 lakhs has to be contributed by the financial institutions who are the stakeholders in the company in proportion to their financial debt. And finally, this will be considered as interim finance and it will be paid before any person is paid, and also it carries an interest at the rate of bank rate. And the regulation 21 capital A, and that's again concerning the uh, secured creditors who are not relinquishing their security interest in favor of the liquidation estate, 
And it is clearly said in the regulation that where a secured creditor proceeds to realize its security interest, it shall pay. See, it shall pay because see, as much uh, towards the amount payable under clause A and sub clause one of clause B. These are the two things. One, that whatever he's required to contribute for the payment of uh, CIRP cost and liquidation cost that he will have to pay uh, before he is uh, given his own uh, asset on which he is not relinquishing the security interest. And also the clause one of clause, the, the sub clause one of clause B, that means the dues of workmen. So these two things, it has to be paid by the uh, secured creditor who is not ready to relinquish one, the CIRP cost and the liquidation cost and two, uh, the amount payable to the workman. This is provided in uh, section 53 and it is very clearly said that as it would have shared in case he had relinquished the security interest to the liquidator within 90 days from the liquidation commencement date. So he has to pay this amount within 90 days uh, then only he would be given his asset. So the wording that we are reading here is as it would have shared in case it had relinquished the security interest. Now, had he relinquished the security interest, the liquidator would have sold it. The liquidator would have also claimed the fee on realization and distribution. Therefore, it is very clear that the secured creditor who is not relinquishing the security interest will also pay CIRP cost and liquidation cost and also the liquidator's fee that will be paid before the liquidator uh, hand over the asset to the secured creditor. Uh, so Aditya, I think uh, uh, what is your opinion on this? Right, sir. So before as of we go now, to the judge, we, before we go to the judgments, so yeah. these are the previous yeah, I was going to come on to this that uh, reading uh, regulation 33 and 34, I think uh, 25 minutes into the webinar, the most common question which is, which is coming up from a lot of people is that what is an uh, IP supposed to do? So in case of operational creditors, when the at, at the time of the admission, when it is said that, okay, 2 lakhs or 3 lakhs is to be granted and that amount is not paid by the operational creditor. What is the IP supposed to do at that point of time? And also if the COC after approving of the, the whole CIRP cost are not willing to pay, then in that case, what is an IP supposed to do? So what what, what is the, the measure? Uh, that they, one, because see, this is an order of the court that the applicant will pay two lakhs of rupees. Yeah. Or three lakhs of rupees. So in case he is not paying, then it is a contempt of court. Immediately, the RP should file a contempt of court after giving him two, three reminders. Uh, and in case uh, he is not paying within reasonable time, then the, it's a contempt case. Then the contempt must be filed. This is number one. Now, in case the committee of creditors is not contributing, then the committee of creditors will have access to NCLT. They will go to NCLT that uh, uh, the uh, like, see, the, the question is that the RP is only supposed to refund this money to applicant in case the money is available. He can right. only try to recover it from the committee of creditors. In case it is not recoverable, then the amount cannot be refunded back to the applicant. Applicant can go to the court that it is not being refunded to me. RP will submit its reply that he is not getting the funding from the COC. And then the COC will be made party to it. I believe if the applicant is not getting the refund of the amount paid, he should go to the NCLT and also make RP and the COC both a party. And I believe the NCLT will give directions to the COC that this money, which the which is paid by the applicant should be paid back. Do you think that it will happen? Correct, sir. So with the suggestion that you are giving as per our own litigation experience as well that, you know, and after the Supreme Court judgment in January 2022, whereby the Supreme Court has clearly directed, we'll discuss that in uh, a short while right now, and that will majorly 
clarify the position as to how the litigation should be taken ahead by the ip in case the fees has to be decided by the nclt but yes the application goes before the nclt that's a must and uh, the right should be exercised so that the scrutiny happens at least and uh, you get the option to appeal and again appeal before the supreme court if you are not satisfied by the results there so what are the other questions aditya before we go to the judicial pronouncements so uh, a few are going on there are few views there is one of the view that by which says that bank should be mandated to provide the estimated cost as a working capital towards cirp slash liquidation cost at a nominal interest rate the interest would accumulate as a part of the cirp cost this is they they are looking for your comment on this statement i think he is talking about interim finance which is required for operations of the company and um, there has been uh, the instances where the banks have given the interim finance however this uh, uh, is not really a practice to give interim finance for uh, running the company it's basically the banks are not really having faith that this money will come back so they don't want to put good money uh, against bad money so therefore they are not inclined to contribute as an interim finance uh, amen this is of course this law also says that the interim finance should be raised by the rp and the company which is uh, under uh, stress should be able to continue the operations with some comfort that's what the law provides but then the banks are not contributing interim finance the market has not been developed completely for interim finance so therefore presently it is not happening right so there is this question by mr praveen which says that can the coc reduce the fees after the resolution plan is submitted to the a and awaiting approval no we uh, have a judgment which is slightly different fact which also says that the coc has all the powers but when when we look at the facts of that case i think it is slightly different the coc uh, has been I, doing it i think when when the uh, adjudicating authority i'm sorry yes, yes. Uh, so i think the couple of these judgments uh, aditya which you can say i mean mean i think this nivo growth credit private limited versus resolution professional it was in the case of baskar marine services private limited and clad judgment dated 2020 basically it was assurance that the committee of creditors has to contribute uh, and this was a prime order where it was held that the committee of creditors has to contribute because see we are we are trying to find out under what provision the committee of creditor is required to contribute so we could find this nivo growth and we also find another case and this was an appeal preferred by new growth credit private limited a member of the coc uh, the it was uh, against the order where the nclt directed new growth uh, to bear 27% of the cirp cost now this new growth is saying that uh, uh, he had withdrawn his claim uh, from the cirp uh, the, then he was also the, the argument from the new growth uh, who was asked to contribute also it, the argument was that the uh, the resolution professional allowed their withdrawal of the claim however the withdrawal was set aside later on by the adjudicating authority it was not permitted that somebody has a right to withdraw the claim that was also uh, it, it, this is that kind of case and nclt held in this case that the the, the new growth uh, is is uh, required to contribute 27% of the cost Uh, which was the because the cost was already approved it was supported by documents so therefore they are supposed to share their uh, cost but this was muthut finance limited versus southern investment private limited was little better case it was in fact 2019 where the chennai bench uh, where the appellant was muthut finance uh, the muthut finance was required to pay 6 lakhs 6.61 6. lakhs as a share of uh, the uh, A remuneration of IRP RP. Now the argument from the um, Muthut Finance was uh, that they are only financial creditor. They only filed the claim. They were also part of the COC, and the the liability to pay remuneration does not come from uh, it does not come from the appellant because he he says 
Muthut Finance said that it is not my responsibility to pay the fees of the RP. And they further argued uh, that the uh, when the company, the corporate debtor is available, the it is the duty of the corporate debtor to pay the amount. I mean, the, the bench should direct the corporate debtor to pay the salary of the remuneration of the RP. Uh, they, they also said that they have not been benefited with anything, but is settled with, settled with the burden of the payment because they also argued that they are not getting any benefit out of this CIRP. They, this is something which is the, the, uh, the facts of the case and the arguments were also like this. Now the decision of the appellate tribunal was that uh, we are not concerned whether the appellant benefited or not. This is one. They have to contribute. It is irrespective whether they have been benefited or not. Secondly, the uh, appellate tribunal said that the section 25, subsection 2, clause C of the IBC, it is the duty of the RP to take actions during CIRP to raise interim finance subject to the approval of COC under section 28. It was also held that when it is shown in the present matter that COC has fixed fee and other members of the COC have contributed towards the fee of the resolution professional in proportion to their voting shares, the appellant cannot be heard saying that it will not contribute, especially when the same is recoverable. So they could not find any error in the NCLT order directed the applicant to pay. This was the order in the case of Muthut Finance. So these are the two orders of Ditya where we actually found that probably it comes out of the judicial pronouncements that the COC is required to contribute. Now, this is where people are asking questions like the competence of the COC to revise already approved fee of the RP. Now, there are many cases where the resolution plan has been submitted, the work pressure on the RP has reduced, the resolution plan is not getting admitted for the next one year or two years, RP is entitled to the fee as approved by the committee of creditors, Committee of creditors is now repeatedly approaching the RP to reduce the fee and what is to be done. So to my understanding, uh, because see like uh, there has to be, a, there has to be a concept of undue enrichment. So in case the, uh, the responsibilities of the RP is reduced to some extent, uh, the resolution process has already been completed and the resolution plan has already been submitted to NCLT. RP is only doing the control and custody on the assets and maintaining the security on the assets. And also in case there are some operations, then he may even, he may be even running the operation. So depending upon each case to case, if the RP is ready to reduce the fee for this longer period, uh, in case it stretches too long, I think it is fair demand of the committee of creditors because if the NCLT is not finding time or the resolution plan has some disputed issues, which is yet to be resolved, I think this all should not work for undue enrichment of the RP. This is what is my opinion. And what do you say? So wherever the COC has revised the fee of the RP uh, with retrospective effect or from the date uh, when this resolution plan is submitted to NCLT, it's pending for approval. I think there is some justice depending upon case to case. So in case we see this erstwhile RP of the best ways transport India private limited versus Rina Tiwari, this is again an appellate tribunal order. It's a very, very recent 4th of May, 2022. So it was a case where the COC uh, in, in their meeting on Fifth of uh, on, in May 21, resolved to pay the fee of the erstwhile RP, including expenses incurred by the erstwhile RP till the reappointment of the new RP. The adjudicating authority, after approving the replacement of the RP, issued directions to the reconstituted CUC to consider the CIRP fee of erstwhile RP in its first meeting. Erstwhile RP submitted that there was no occasion for issuing directions to reconstituted COC to, re to consider the CIRP fees of Erstwhile RP as the same has already been approved. Now, the fee was approved, then the RP was changed while 
while passing the order, the NCLT also directed that the, in the very first meeting, the fee of the RP should be considered. Now, further submitted that in view of the regulation 12.3 of the CIRP, the decision taken by COC would not affect the validity of the decision. So the, this was the argument of the RP that why uh, reviewing, why reviewing the fee of the RP, which was already settled. So in this case, only the NCLAT said uh, that the NCLAT did not find any error in the directions of the adjudicating authority for considering the CIRP cost, since major portion of the CIRP as claimed is subsequent to the resolution passed at the first place. A resolution was passed in the first meeting, RP was changed, NCLT must have taken five, six months. Now the RP is claiming the fee as originally agreed by the COC. Now the, it was the direct, the uh, NCLT said that it is, uh, the direction should be, it should be reviewed. So it was held in this case that uh, the uh, CIRP process, the COC is fully competent to revise the fee even if it was earlier approved by any earlier COC decision. The entitlement of the fee depend upon several factors, including the change of the circumstances, the length of the CIRP proceeding, Hence, we are of the view that the CIRP regulations, uh, 12 uh, sub regulation three, uh, does not fetter the COC to consider the fee and expenditure, especially when we have noticed that the expenditure claimed are also subsequent period to the uh, uh, first and second COC. Now, it is, it is to some extent, uh, like when we say that the RP is changed and it took five months in changing the RP, the IRP continued its work as deemed RP, whatever work he did. So that is the kind of review and reassessment which was directed to the uh, COC. To my understanding, uh, when in the very first meeting the fee is approved, thereafter that fee should be payable. It should only be reduced in case the IRP has not worked, but IRP must have worked because it is very clearly written in the law that after 40th day of commencement of uh, CIRP, the RP would, IRP would become deemed RP and all actions, all duties of the RP would be managed by deemed RP. So even the valuations and the expression of interest, bid evaluation metrics, everything is required to be done by IRP till RP is replaced. So the reducing the fee uh, is, is really not justified. It, it is really not justified. So even we were also thinking of filing an appeal before the Supreme Court, but after looking into the facts, we thought that the Supreme Court might not even indulge into this. However, we have also seen that the Supreme Court has passed an order in on 5th of January, 2022. And that order also we are going to discuss. So Aditya, I think you can speak something about the jurisdiction of the IBBI to regulate payment uh, of the remuneration. I will just uh, shift these slides. So this is the order. I think if you, uh, or, or you can even provide some um, uh, comments on this. Uh, if you can right. just so, see, yes. I can, I can, sir. So basically in this fees, uh, the fees was proposed by the IRP and the, while the case was before the adjudicating authority, the adjudicating authority in order to determine the fees had referred this matter to IBBI to uh, determine the quantum of the fees. And uh, the insolvency professional here went to the appellate court suggesting that the IBBI has no jurisdiction to decide the question of payment of the fees of the appellant per se. Now the uh, appellate authority being the NCLAT had uh, uh, in this case you know, uh, contemplated the issue whether the IBBI has the jurisdiction or not. So it was in a nutshell decided that since the NCLT and the NCLT, they may have the, you know, the judicial power to determine the, uh, the fees, the IBBI being the executive power also has the, uh, you know, powers under section 240 of the court to make the regulations for the fees and everything. So as we were discussing that, you know, the, as, as in liquidation, we have, uh, regulation 2A, whereby uh, it is mandated that, you know, such and such amount will be contributed. So even in the CIRP, it could also be in uh, the, the IBBI also could have powers whereby they can just mandate as to how the procedure and how the fees will be uh, quantified 
and finalized in such cases so this was in a nutshell the decision of the appellate authority so as per our experience this was a case where the rp proposed a fee of 2 lakhs coc yes. uh, took a decision to approve a fee of 50000 rupees when the rp was replaced then the irp went to court uh, that he proposed fee of 2 lakh and without the consent of the irp the coc decided 50000 rupees so <clears throat> the uh, nclt said that between 2 lakhs and 50000 rupees how can uh, nclt decide so therefore they referred it to the uh, ibbi so the irp challenge uh, challenge whether this uh, referring to ibbi is uh, uh, lawful or not so it was held as lawful and i have also seen in couple of cases when such kind of uh, matter goes to ibbi they uh, constitute a committee of two or three uh, experienced rps and along with the one of the officials of uh, ibbi and they all collectively see the uh, and review the work done by the insolvency professional and kind of time spent and then they assess fee and they recommend that fee to uh, adjudicating authority for a order this is not bad because see the ibbi understands the work ibbi understands the obligations on the uh, irp so therefore this is considered uh, a welcome move if the ibbi uh, uh, like kind of resolves the disputes if there are any they, they intervene in such controversies they intervene so, so uh, i think so now a few questions yes. few questions yes. as we go forward there right. are a few questions which ask about the fee of the irp and rp during the stay and we'll go on to that when we have the matters right. of nclt so there is this question by mr uh, parameshwaran nayar which asks that whether the home buyers can deny from contributing their share of cost of cirp so this is a practical issue because although there was some orders from justice mm M. kumar where uh, they said i think this was a case somewhere nam name of the case was some reliance that you can deny the claim of uh, an a home buyer uh, in case he is not contributing but i think that has not been uh, impacted because see in case there are 1000 home buyers and in case you try to collect some amount from them uh, you would see that the uh, most of the people are not paying only 20% 30% people would pay and once uh, the other people are not paying so there is nothing that we have in our hands to do uh, it is also little bit of uh, injustice that in case we say that whatever 1 crore of 50 lakhs rupees that were paid as uh, advance for uh, buying a property uh, that claim would not be accepted since you are not contributing 10000 rupees it is also a kind of little injustice interim finance is also not uh, practically or the industry is not developed there is nobody who actually coming forward for interim finance so my understanding is that it is very difficult to say that we can do something in case the home buyers are not contributing what is your opinion aditya practically and legally practically sir as of now how the adjudicating authority even if the rp moves to the adjudicating authority uh, i i think due to the emotional stress and the financial stress that they have gone through the bench always sides with them as yeah. to why they should be contributing immediately and the orders are not per se taken immediately so that is also a litigation which is going to you know even incur costs and not going to give you any results per se so i believe uh, the srd if the home buyers are not contributing uh, i think we should repeatedly uh, send them reminder we should repeatedly pursue them then it is possible to get some recovery but you make sure that the 100% you should actually assume that 100% would not pay now the right. other orders are like now we are discussing powers of the adjudicating authority to decide the fee of rp in this manner in this case this manoj kumar singh versus the ebpl ventures private limited it's again and clear judgment march 22 very recent one so this is a case where the appeal 
was filed against the order you see like look the dates are very important uh, the order dated 15th of march 22 this was passed by the adjudicating authority in which the application under section 9 was admitted but the order was uploaded on 24th of march now the irp came to know about this order on 24th of march maybe that he uh, might have seen that the court has uh, reserved it for order and uh, the the in the order the irp was appointed so on 24th march he got the order on 25th march he made the publication and this and the said order dated 15th of march 22 was stayed by anclad on 25th of march 22 itself now the order was uploaded on 24th order was stayed on 25th within one day the order was stayed now irp submitted that he is entitled to publication expenses as well as miscellaneous expenses now what is the observation of the court in this case because see it was only for one day operations one day in the present case the order was uploaded on 24 and um, the next date 25th is was stayed uh, no further step was to be required to be taken the irp made publication the tribunal is of the view that the irp is not entitled to any kind of fee or other expenses except the expenditure on the publication i think this is fair enough aditya like it is something that on 24th you got an order 25th it was stayed and you you are still getting the publication newspaper the fee was not given I mean, this is what was the order I mean, although i think, I think sir, for for the professionals who are working for the insolvency professional is this is a you know grave concern because in this case the publication money has been paid but the fees of the lawyer would not have been approved as far as i know in many of my cases whereby the matter has been stayed the fees of the lawyer is never approved they say that it's all right if you just moved an application that's all i think uh, you are right because it is not only the publication it are the other expenditures also the other right. expenditures include all this litigation where the rp is supposed to be representing so if the right. rp is representing and he is spending time maybe that from 20th from 15th or 25th he actually remained engaged so some fees uh, uh, was required to be given some fees so right. therefore based on these kind of orders based on these kind of orders which are actually very very ad hoc orders therefore i am saying that the i will take it to uh, the uh, first, first of all the uh, i will come back to this slide but in the meantime i will take out to the uh, last uh, one which is uh, which is important uh, it's because the supreme court devarajan the, this uh, this devarajan raman versus bank of india limited this was the supreme court order it was january 5th 2022 now let us see what the supreme court says because see in this particular case the nclt just ad hoc uh, sanction of 5 lakhs of rupees plus gst was allowed as fee of the rp for the entire period now the uh, the rp had gone uh, to the supreme court and Uh, the facts in this case is that the appellant in the case had been appointed as IRP by the order of the NCLT. The order of the NCLT was set aside in appeal by Anclad, and the proceedings were remitted to NCLT to decide upon the fee and cost incurred by the appellant to be borne by the respondent. That means financial creditor. The appellant addressed a letter to the respondent claiming an amount of rupees fourteen lakh as the amount payable as fee and the cost uh, of which an amount of rupees five point six six was reimbursed by the respondent, leaving a balance. An amount of nine lakhs was balanced. The appellant moved to NCLT to obtain the release of the remaining fee and cost. By its order, the NCLT directs the respondent bank to pay five lakhs plus GST towards the fee of the appellant. Now, in appeal by way of the impugned order and judgment, Anclad dismissed the appeal, observing that the expenditure had been allowed in full, and the consolidated amount of five lakhs plus GST allowed as fee. So, first, uh, see the ad hocism. NCLT only paid 5.6 lakhs as an expenditure. The fee was rejected. Now the NCLT passed an NCLT passed an order like okay, give fees of five lakhs rupees. Now this is a Supreme Court order. The Supreme Court says that the order of NCLT, however, reveals that none of the submissions of the appellant has been considered. The adjudicating authority merely directed the respondent to pay the expenses incurred and an amount of rupees five lakhs plus GST towards the fee of the RP. Neither the basis of the claim nor its reasonableness has been considered by the adjudicating authority. 
the appellate authority has merely proceeded in an ad hoc manner on the ground that rupees 5 lakhs as a fee in addition to expenses that appears to be reasonable both the order suffer from an abdication in the exercise of the jurisdiction so in the absence of any reason either by the nclt or appellate authority it is impossible for the court to deduce the basis on which the payment of rupees 5 lakhs together with expenses has been found to be reasonable consequently then order to remand becomes necessary uh, noting that the both the order suffer from an abdication in the exercise of jurisdiction so this is i think supreme court order whenever we have something uh, like this we should refer these orders to adjudicating authority that there should be a basis there should be a, uh, there should be a reasonableness reasoning, reasoning. there has to be reasoning for it correct so i think this is a, a very important order that we have seen uh, from the supreme court and we should all use it so these are some kind of orders uh, uh, which are basically uh, the fee of uh, it was a sanjay kumar ruya versus catholic uh, uh, syrian bank again an enclat order it was in like old order september 2019 Uh, where the appeal has been preferred by the rp with a prayer for direction to pass an appropriate order relating to his fee uh, the adjudicating authority uh, which was bombay bench uh, passed an order of liquidation dismissed the application filed by the rp the learned counsel appearing for the appellant submitted that after the order of the liquidation in which the appellant was replaced and another person has been appointed as the liquidator no whatever might have been done rp was somebody else the liquidator was somebody else rp submitted an application however the liquidator was somebody liquidator he was not appointed as liquidator somebody else was appointed as liquidator so this was also argued that the rp could not succeed and it result in liquidation therefore anclat allowed the erstwhile rp to file affidavit showing the correct amount of fee and actual cost incurred by him now the N- nclt and anclat they have uh, ignored the approvals by committee of creditors right. approvals of the expenditure approval of the fee and they are taking a view that since the rp failed in bringing a resolution therefore uh, he the rp should give us affidavit showing the correct amount of the fee and the actual expenditure it is not referring to rather whether it was approved by the coc or not but the nclt is now trying to understand what is the correct amount of fee in case it is a it is not approved by the coc then of course it becomes uh, the adjudicating authority's job to resolve it but in case it is approved by the committee of creditors then it has to be contributed and paid by the coc the appellant has filed brief note because it, the brief note was filed on the expenditure incurred showing professional fee retainership fee office rent everything was submitted along with the bills and also it is shown that it was approved by the committee of creditors now that they see uh, the rp was appointed the coc was a coc approved their fee coc approved the expenditure but the only thing is that the and the and nclt is saying that since the resolution failed then you bring you you, you submit us the correct fee correct i think the that's something the payment of dues of resolution plus by professional this is an issue if the resolution process could not succeed and it resulted in liquidation power of the liquidator to reject the claim of the rp once approved by the committee of creditors so in this case the the new liquidator he in fact rejected the claim of the rp the decision was that on presumption of the record and plat was satisfied with the brief note of the expenditure incurred by the appellant rp but expressing without expressing any opinion or determining the total amount and plat remitted the matter to the liquidator in view of the fact that the liquidation proceedings have already been started now the details of the claim as shown in the brief note of expenditure incurred and spent Uh, by resolution professional which are stated to have been approved by this committee coc uh, the appellant had filed them before the liquidator now the decision was in the case of sanjay kumar ruya that the 
amount based on the bills ledgers have been approved by the coc the liquidator cannot reject the same being the resolution cost and not the claim of a creditor it is made clear that the professional fee and the cost incurred by the appellant if approved by the coc should be allowed so this is a this is a welcome this is a good decision like it, if it is approved by the coc it should have been allowed so enclad made it clear that the fee of the rp and the cost incurred by him being resolution cost has been allowed the liquidator to determine the claim under section 40 of the ib code appellant being not a creditor once the amount is shown as fee and the resolution cost is same would be payable under section 53 so this is the uh, a welcome kind of a scenario so that's that's it uh, that's it i think this uh, indusind bank uh, judgment which in the case of rajinder kumar bhuta uh, rp of trust house commerce center private limited it was again an enclad judgment in april 22 a recent judgment so uh, this was a kind of uh, uh, slightly uh, uh, complicated uh, the appeal uh, file against the order passed by the adjudicating authority uh, the resolution professional reimbursement was asked for a 30 lakh the cirp was initiated on in march 2018 coc was formed in july 2018 and the insolvency resolution professional was appointed in july that means after about 4 months the suspended board of directors filed appeal before this tribunal which appeal was ultimately dismissed by the tribunal against which the matter has gone to supreme court so this was an issue of uh, uh, limitation uh, so uh, so far we have seen that the four months have passed irp worked however the uh, the enclad dismissed the appeal of the promoter but then the supreme court in september 19 in supreme september 19 the supreme court in fact allowed the application and the, the it was held as a time barred application and the cirp proceedings was con considered to be void ab initio and that was the even the enclad judgment was set aside now when the supreme court uh, in fact had stayed the insolvency proceedings like see when the application was submitted to supreme court maybe somewhere in august uh, 2018 and it was the supreme court stayed the insolvency proceedings therefore they are saying that once the supreme court has stayed it uh, therefore there is no entitlement to with the fee to be paid by the rp however the rp's counsel refuted the submissions of the learned counsel and contended that even when the insolvency proceedings were stayed certain expenditures were incurred by the rp which payment cannot be denied because see of course the lawyers fee everything so this was the issue rp's fee during the stay of cirp so it was considered uh, that we are of the considered view that the fee of the rp during the cirp period of the corporate debtor for the time from 13th june 2018 to 2nd september 2019 constitute Shooting rupees twenty is to be paid by the financial creditors, that is Indusind Bank and the other cooperative bank. Uh, further, apart from the above fee, other expenses, as indicated at page number so, aggregated five lakhs is to be paid by the corporate debtor. The decision came when the Honorable Supreme Court, by interim order dated twenty sixth of November eighteen, stayed the insolvency proceeding, which proceedings ultimately were set aside by the final judgment dated second September. Enclad was of the view that the resolution professional is not entitled for any fee after twenty sixth of November, twenty eighteen. So RP is only entitled to fee from thirteenth June, twenty eighteen to twenty fifth of November, twenty eighteen. Hence, the order of the adjudicating authority is modified to the above extent. So the Enclad actually said that when the Supreme Court had passed an interim order staying the proceeding, there should not be any fee. So this was interest in bank uh, arbitra. so i think the time is up we don't want to take more time i think this is the the most important case has been discussed and okay. we need to see if there is any question because we also have discussed this part uh, kind of uh, the the supreme court judgment so in case think, you have uh, any questions that we can attend and then we we can even uh, because it's important to discuss if there are questions 
Yes, I think uh, the question of stays is the most important after this uh, Mr. Ruya's judgment, whereby the the NCLAD had suggested that you know during the period of the stay, the RP is not going is not supposed to is not entitled, I would say, for any fees, because as we were discussing on plenty of occasions, even in our uh, our of our few cases as well, the RP is constantly working as per the compliances at, as directed by the IBBI regulations. So during the stay, even during the stay, it is not like the RP is not working. So what happens to those? So I think uh, as a caution, whenever there is a stay uh, of the proceedings, uh, then the RP should uh, should not uh, put more efforts. So there are two, three kinds of uh, uh, stays. One is a stay on the CIRP process. If there is a stay on CIRP process, that means that the RP is not supposed to do anything. Correct. But however, according to my practical experience, even if there is a stay from Supreme Court uh, not to proceed further, the control and custody of the assets continues to be with the RP because it doesn't go back to the promoters or the corporate data. The watch and ward and security of the assets also continue with the RP because who else will do that? I mean, you can't even tell the company to take it back because the process has been stayed, but the RP has not been absolved from his responsibilities. Third, but wherever litigation would happen, the RP would engage lawyers, RP would brief the lawyers, all the documents would be submitted to RP. So in fact, RP would be spending more time even during stay processes. So, and other, in case the company is as a, is a running unit, then the RP will definitely continue the operations. RP will manage the operation, manage the bank account. Saying that the CIRP process is stayed and the RP would not be doing anything, that is not practically possible. Legally, it is not possible. So therefore, this is a controversial area. So how much fees is required to be paid? Because the only thing that he is not doing is he is not inviting expression of interest. He is not doing bid evaluation matrix. He is not doing uh, the resolution plan. He is not uh, presenting resolution plan. That's what he's not doing. But the three things uh, which are the prime duties of the RP, number one, taking control and custody of the assets. Number two, uh, keeping the company as a going concern. Uh, uh, num number three, uh, preservation and protection of the assets of the corporate debtor. These are the three primary responsibilities of the RP, which continues even during any stay on the uh, CIRP process. So this is what is my opinion. The second kind of stay is where the stay is on the, only on the resolution process. Processing, the, of resolution. processing of the resolution plans. In that case also, the RP continues to do all these three basic things. And three basic things, in fact, consumes a lot of time and a lot of team and a lot of efforts is required from the RP. I'm only saying that whenever such opportunity comes, our RP uh, professional colleagues, they must argue and they must try to say that this is, these are the efforts, these are the primary three duties of the RP and how do we handle these three duties of the RP? And in case of such a stay, in case of any such stay, I still feel that immediately the insolvency professional should file an application to seek clarity that this is is there anything that i am supposed to do because this is a company and would i be entitled to my fee I mean, that kind of clarification two two way clarification one that the coc mandate and also going to nclt then only this kind of uh, unclad judgments would actually be reviewed there has to be some presentation some mandate from the coc and we, these three things are mandatory. So in case we argue that these three things are continuing, therefore the fee is payable. This is what is uh, my opinion. So what are the other things? It's regarding the same, sir, everywhere it talks about the- But in the chat also, we have seen a lot many questions in the chat. And you are seeing at Q&A, but in the yeah. chat also, I've seen that a lot of questions are in the chat also. Like Mr. G.P. Madan is saying that even if we file clarification applicants, it will not even be listed for, for days together. So how to resolve the IP's uh, difficulties?
so i think these uh, issue are these issues are actually uh, very very burning issues so right. some so kind of uh, some kind of decide the fee of the rp if the case is stayed for one year and the unit is running or not running so i think the creditors also should be with rp the creditors mandate and then seeking clarification and otherwise the rp would be suffering because of these judgments the judgments that the there was a stay from supreme court that does not absolve the rp from three responsibilities that i am saying and these three responsibilities are very very important and very very time consuming custody and control on all the assets including the bank state in the, including the bank operations preserve, uh, preservation and protection of the assets and keeping the company as a going concern you must everyone all professionals must convey it to the uh, adjudicating authority that this is the prime responsibility of the rp and rp needs fees for this so i, I think this is this is what it is uh, uh, yeah more or less the questions are same only that how how the rp is supposed to proceed if the payments are not made and, and most of the question and... that i am seeing is regarding the home buyers um, right. as i said that the home buyers issue are very very complicated only those rps are little lucky where the company has some uh, Uh, fund flow, then only he would be able to get some uh, good relationship with the home buyers. Otherwise, the relationship with the home buyers would be stressful in case the contribution is asked from them. So, thank you very much, all the participants. So, this was our episode six. We will continue our uh, series of webinars starting every Sunday at four p.m. to five p.m. for one hour. all our webinars are available on our youtube channel triple a insolvency and uh, we are not doing any politics it is clearly clearly contents that we discuss and there is no other objective except collective learning and this is our way of learning thank you very much aditya for sparing thank time you, thank you thank, thank you, you very so much. much thank you thank you all the participants thank you